Um, thank you, Dan. So uh, we now have an hour for um, questions and discussion. Um, since it is a large group, what we'll ask is that if uh, people can sort of, you know, flag us uh, for attention, we'll uh, try and keep things uh, uh, organized. Uh, sometimes we'll have uh, issues where there may be some follow-up points that may come out of order, so we'll, we'll try and manage that as best we can. But uh, um, are there any specific uh, questions or comments uh, about uh, the ideal state? What we'd like to come away with, um, I think, uh, you know, Dan has put forward some, uh, some ideas related to that, and I think what we'd like to do is to uh, get a synthesis from the group as to, you know, are there points of agreement, points of disagreement, uh, things that uh, we can then reflect on as we uh, tackle some of the individual aspects of data and knowledge representation uh, and implementation. Ah, Sandy. So I thought that that was a great talk, Dan. I had a question for you. So given all of the different interdependencies within when, when building a clinical decision support role, especially if it involves data moving across organizational boundaries, it seems like it's going to be a long time before we're nine sigma in that area. But <laughs> at the same time, we're probably already, I mean, I think in the rules that are stood up, we're already well above one sigma. So we're, we're better than healthcare. And it would just be great to get your thoughts on sort of risk here and, you know, sort of what, how to think about the appropriate level of robustness needed before you decide to launch. Um, so, so Russ Altman uh, wrote an interesting uh, article about uh, pharmacogenomics where he believed the standard was not perfection but non-inferiority. Right. And, and I actually believe that's appropriate here as well, because if the comparison is just the behavior of um, autonomous individuals doing what they remember and, and do by personal bias, then to the extent that a clinical decision support system can measurably and reliably improve upon that baseline standard, uh, as opposed to would it ever make a mistake would, that, you know, that you wouldn't deploy it until you knew it was absolutely perfect, we have at the other end the experience of the FDA shutting down blood banking software because of a few mistakes that were made, therefore, thereby unleashing the natural behavior of people who did not have decision support assistance, and the mistakes dramatically increased. And so I think that tension between um, a perfectly behaving system and we've got to achieve some uh, near perfect level of performance before we believe the risks are acceptable is a, a, an unnecessary impediment to progress. That's a long-winded way. I think somewhere there's a, a sweet spot where you believe the benefits outweigh the risks, but in fact you are willing to accept the risk that sometimes the wrong advice will be given, and, and, and then you'll learn from that and you'll be better as a result of it. Does, does that help? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a really important concept, and I think that uh, uh, a lot of times, and certainly in some of the discussions that uh, I've been party to related to, uh, you know, regulation of clinical decision support systems and some of the policies around that, seems to assume that, you know, current practice is gold standard, uh, and that, uh, you know, we have to somehow, um, uh, you know, meet some uh, a standard that's impossible, and all of us know that that we're really not talking about any sort of a standard in practice. And so, I think that that concept of non-inferiority is a is a very important one. And I'd love to add just a quick coda. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges we have on the CDS side of things is actually measuring performance, as Dan pointed out. To get that whole closed loop idea, we need a way to differentiate that CDS which works from that CDS which doesn't. And there's some interesting ideas around a, a new metric called the number needed to remind that might allow us to differentiate high-performing alerts and reminders from low-performing alerts and reminders. But that's a key component. Mark. Hi, that was a great talk, Dan. Um, I think if we look at the headlines about the Ebola incident in Dallas, that was a, uh, a failure of decision support and to, to have checklists available. My concern is that the reaction now is uh, everybody's going to download PDFs, and that's the best that we can do is human consumable decision support. And I think that's a, a really important, I hope it's not a what affects one of us affects all of us moment, because, you know, there's that feeling that this could be a, you know, it could go in any number of directions, but I think it's a real informative example of 
where we are versus where we need to be and where in the ideal state. As a friend of mine posted on Facebook yesterday, a bowl and Rick Perry, what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> uh, Jeff, I think you're next. We're being recorded. Yes. So there are also some people behind. I know that, and I'm sure I'll have uh, problems related to that, but that's all right. So, Dan, I also really enjoyed your remarks. Um, in, in the ideal state, it's implied that the heuristic nature of the system that you proposed um, will uh, establish maybe a better clinical standard than it are currently in uh, clinical guidelines. So how do you envision that reconciliation between what professional organizations would say is the appropriate thing to do and what a ideal state that's learning faster than professional organizations can actually ever react to? Uh, how will that kind of get reconciled in your, in your future state? Yeah, so I, I think the power is in the data itself and in its transparency and, and its volume. So that the reason you have to do guidelines with groups of uh, people who give expert opinions is that by and large you're trying to reason in a space where you, have a, you don't have access to all the, all the data and you're trying to ex extrapolate a small experience to a larger one. So the closer you can come to not doing just statistical subsetting and, and extrapolation, where you actually have the data of the whole experience across the entire industry, the more powerful the data itself becomes about the reality of whether something works or doesn't work. So I actually believe that if you had uh, guidelines committees of uh, professional societies, um, and then you empower them with this, these classes of data at scale that they've never seen before, they'll work a lot faster and be much more effective even doing what they were done. So I don't see attention, but rather uh, actually an improvement of the historical process of guideline development. Right, and so maybe in, your, um, in that commons that you envision would be surrounded by these professional organizations who are really using that as their primary data source perhaps. Yeah, I think another issue related to the guidelines is that uh, any of us that have tried to convert uh, guidelines uh, into uh, decision support, and Bob and I have been working on this in the, in the pharmacogenomics realm uh, as part of the CPIC uh, informatics group, is that we love to write guidelines with what my friend Alan Morris calls uh, weasel words, uh, meaning that we say you may consider or so they're not adequately explicit. And so I think that this, it's uh, not only the, the, uh, the translation of the evidence, but it's, it's, it's translating it in such a way that we get away from this uh, uh, reliance on, well, consider this or may do this or that, to really say, we really, th this is what the evidence shows us, so this is what, you know, needs to be done, and that can then be translated into, um, uh, and, and of course we don't have an established evidentiary standard at which point, you know, and that's why we, Frequently, it devolves to individual organization thought leaders to say, "Well, what are we going to do?" As opposed to looking at, you know, what you know we as a specialty or we as a healthcare system are going to do. So, Brian. So, I have a question about the, the very nice talk, Dan, and I, the, the, about um, kind of what what these desiderata actually mean in relation to each other, and, and it may help me define for myself at least what the scope of this meeting is. So in Desiderata 1 and number 9, both talk about separation of different types of knowledge. Number 1 talks about separation of the primary molecular observations from clinical interpretations, and 9 then talks about the separation of classification from clinical decision support knowledge. And um, if we talk about standardization and being able to develop um, uh, knowledge across different institutions, then um, we have observations on one level, classifications on another level, and then a knowledge base on another level. And um, if observations can clearly be machine, mach machine readable, not, don't necessarily have to be human readable, then these classifications are somewhere in the middle that I don't think there's any standardization on at all. Um, and then this knowledge base, which is the ultimate kind of thing which, which we'd like to develop, um, and I guess the, the question I have then, is this meeting about that higher um, tier of CDS knowledge, clinical decision support knowledge, um, and does it rely on, uh, um, is, is it foundation all that this, this classification system be standardized um, if there is truly separation? If there's really three tiers um, in this desiderata that, that, that need to be separated from each other, then 
which tier are we discussing here in this meeting? So I'll take a, a, a stab at that. Um, I think that uh, to some degree the, uh, uh, the purpose of the meeting is not so much to necessarily reconcile um, you know, the 14 elements or to, uh, you know, uh, define, but I think it is to understand and prioritize. So I think that, you know, if this, you know, from your perspective is something that uh, is a key element uh, that needs to be understood and, and somehow uh, made functional so that we can achieve ideal state, then that's something that we should be spending a lot of time saying, how do we actually um, mm -hmm. uh, accomplish this? And so I, I would look at it as being more, um, a, as we go through these things, finding the things that perhaps we don't have agreement on, where there is some disagreement or confusion, and then try to say, okay, well then what is really uh, uh, needed? Um, uh, and uh, I'll go Jim, and then I want to uh, let Ken and Brandon uh, weigh in on this as well, since uh, you know, we really haven't given you the opportunity to talk about you know, the genesis of your uh, desiderata. Uh, so, um, one group that Dan didn't have on his table uh, who are autonomous and who don't use standard practice for reproducible results as researchers. <laughs> um, and uh, that raises, in my view, the issue of the base of the pyramid, which is the genome itself. Um, that that is still fluid, how you assemble reads, how you call variants. Um, and so, uh, I would introduce that uh, we also need to consider a practice to have uh, a stable, renewable base of that information uh, that's refreshed by best practices on uh, a regular basis and that is accessible to every healthcare system and decision report system, uh, not necessarily reproduced in everyone. Great. Yeah, so I think I'll just, uh, just talk a little bit about how we started the Desiderata. Um, I was at Utah, I, I did my PhD with, uh, under, under Ken, and uh, the goal ultimately was to build a, a decision support system that could support the genome, and using the stuff that uh, Ken has done in OpenCDS, um, we applied it to the genome, and we were using Dr. Macy's uh, Desiderata as a, a framework for doing this, but we realized as we started building it that there were a lot of other implicit requirements that we knew about that weren't articulated in, in the desiderata, but were, were essential. And we, we essentially stopped the development and, until we defined these desiderata because we felt that was really important to have this guideline and structure to go forward. And so, so we did that. And, you know, in any good project, you get sidetracked by other ideas that come up, and that's exactly what happened, and it's turned out to be a good thing. And so it's really neat to see it kind of really come together. Um, and I think we're um, headed in the right direction with this, um, and it's really, it's not to kind of force people to, to do this, but to provide guidelines and ideas. Of, this is what to be aware of when you are building decision support. So, Ken? And I'll just note with the Desiderata, <clears throat> Brandon really ran with it, so appropriately named Welch et al. Desiderata. Um, and we did c consult with the community, send out uh, email to listservs, um, so it was really this kind of a, community consensus building, it wasn't just like we just came up with it, it was asking people what they thought. Just wanted to add two comments for what was discussed. One was with regard to the classification issue, and I think this brings up a good issue of when we're thinking about genomic distance support, we should probably think about what can we learn from what we've done in distance support for 30, 40 years outside, because there's a clear analog there to things like the Cerner Maltum and the Metaspan and the First Data Bank. and. NDFRT where there are commercial and some non-commercial hierarchies that are developed and how do we use that? What's, why is that happening the way it is? What are the issues? Um, I, I think we just have a lot to learn. I think along those lines too, I really liked uh, uh, Dan's uh, comments about nuclear, nuclear power, aviation, and healthcare. And I think it, it really s it brings up the point of we probably have the current state because that's where all the forces are making us go. So what is the root cause of us not having scalable distance support? Of, you know, it, it really primarily being institution-driven, sometimes vendor-centric. And 
I would posit it's because right, we, there has not been an actual business case for implementing distance sport to date, and I think that's changing. Um, I'm certainly seeing it at our, our institution where this building distance sport and standardized care now is actually a business case, and I, I think that's a good thing, and we should align with those larger level issues that occur at the C-suite and at the executive level, what a healthcare system should do. And I think if we align with that, we can make a lot of progress fast. Kurt. I just wanted to comment, as a physician, we've been suffering from decision support alert fatigue because decision support hasn't been very specific. As a neurologist, I can't tell you how many times I've been told the drugs that I'm prescribing as standard of care have a contraindication that's not based in fact. And I think... Or an interaction. An interaction, yeah. And so, you know, the classic example in my case would be for Parkinson's disease drug to use a specific MAOB inhibitor with the standard dopaminergic drugs. When the, when the concern comes up from non-selective inhibitors or MAO inhibitors that are used in psychiatry. And I think we have the same risk of doing things in genetics, again, that will lead to, uh, if we don't parallel develop this, so I was really pleased for Dan's comment about, you know, that we have to have this feedback loop to do it, because if we don't have this feedback loop exercise really quickly, we're going to have a lot of differences. And so as an example, something like that we see right now, so we're in the new, we have a newborn screening project at UNC as well as an adult uh, exome sequencing project for medical genetics. And the genes that we're going to, things that we're going to report in the two populations are completely different. And if we don't have context specific information, you're going to lead to this, and then we don't have that fast, it's going to lead to this uh, distrust to the system that's going to be rather destructive. I think those are excellent points, and, and you know, I think we, in, in our presentations, you know, we tend to um, uh, devolve to showing alerts because that's pretty much what we have in our armamentarium, but I think we all recognize that uh, uh, there's a lot of flaws, and so, you know, one of the takeaways, I think, in terms of an ideal state is, are there different ways that we could potentially uh, do this. Uh, the other point that, you know, comes up with the drug interactions, uh, there was a very interesting uh, meeting um, uh, that uh, where we had some of the vendors that were producing this and said, well, we can, we can give you just the significant ones, but our lawyers say, we don't want the liability. That should follow the clinician. And so the systems then uh, get everything. Uh, yeah. That and then and then we have the the situation that we all that we all. I mean, hear. I would I'd take in point. You know, the use of Plavix in neurology has different indications whether to do CYP two C nineteen genotyping or not, and it and it basically and so it's context specific, and the real reason is because in neurology the difference between using aspirin or Plavix doesn't make that much difference in the outcome of patients. You have to treat a lot of patients to get an effect, a huge number of patients to get an effect with aspirin. And, you know, it's kind of an irony in, in neurology that um, when you have a drug that's so ineffective at presenting disease, it's the common practice now to, when you have a patient has recurrent stroke on aspirin, to call aspirin an aspirin failure and change to Plavix, even though, you know, the effect on outcome is a 1% effect. And so we changed the drug, and so we have this problem. If we, get, if we were starting getting the, you know, the alert that we should be testing the genotype to put someone on Plavix, it's sort of silly because it's not a very effective treatment and it would, you can't even prove that it's actually a good recommendation and because the drugs are changing even so that you won't even need to do it anyway. Uh, no, it's more about Jim Mostel's comment, but yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> two quick thoughts. Um, one, I think Ken's point about actually following the dollars, <laughs> the Willie Sutton's law, you know, is going to be very, very important and, and relevant here. Prior work I was involved with uh, looked at the value of healthcare information exchange, for example, and the value of ambulatory clinical decision support, and those are big numbers, 78 billion, 44 billion, respectively, nationwide stochastic simulations. And in those analyses, we did nothing about genomic decision support, which actually could probably be, you know, orders of magnitude uh, higher. It would be useful to look at that carefully. The second thing I think is we talk a lot about guidelines as the, you know, the primary source of knowledge, and I think we're in the midst of a world evolving from a guideline-based, evidence-based approach to a 
practice-based evidence. And the work at Shrine and Stanford and some of the stuff looking at big data sets of EMR data, comparing patients in real time to the patient before you is going to be extremely relevant here as well. So there's the big data, data science part of this, not just the guidelines. Great. So I, I guess my comment is that uh, in, in traditional clinical gene support system workflow, is, at least I learned, is a big component of it. And, and in my interactions with clinicians, um, part of the problem in the application of genomic medicine is really in which part of the regular workflow do they actually apply these things. So, so I'm just wondering what's the sense of this group in terms of when we try to talk about clini clinical gene support in, in this arena, how do we factor in the workflow? And is that an important consideration? You know, that, <clears throat> I mentioned that briefly in the opening remarks I made. The, the workflow idea in an EMR is completely non-standardized. You know, physicians use EMRs in, you know, a wide variety of ways. And I just saw a report, I can't remember where it's from, but I'll look it up, that in fact there is no standard. You know, across an analysis of New York City EMRs, it was reported by uh, Renu Kashal and colleagues. And this idea of standardizing the workflow may be, you know, anathema to a clinician's practice. But in fact, at Vanderbilt, for example, there's some clinical practice redesign to define a standard operating model. Those kinds of ideas, I think, are going to be very important, just like the checklist in the surgery room or the checklist in, in the 747 cockpit. But there is no yet, there's not yet a standard definition or taxonomy for workflow in EMR. And, and I mean, the interesting point that that raises then is whether this, uh, whether than trying to force a standard, whether this would be another opportunity for an adaptive uh, system where, you know, not only would the, um, uh, th there would be adaptivity related to uh, knowledge in the presentation, but also where do I need it in the workflow versus where do you need it in the workflow, um, which is something that there hasn't been a lot of exploration uh, on, I don't think. Go ahead, Dan. Um, so there's a little uh, interesting uh, uh, outcome of uh, Tenerife that relates to standardized uh, workflow, and that is um, every pilot now in transport category aircraft is required uh, at, at takeoff, the captain puts his hands on the throttle, the first officer puts his hands on the captain's hands, and they move together, thereby giving them both the authority <laughs> to reject the takeoff. And that's a, a, a workflow that didn't exist, a simple mechanical thing to do that is now embedded in the industry. And we have relatively few examples of that in healthcare of people deciding, well, there's a simple mechanical workflow thing you can do to solve the problem. Uh, and I think that's where we need to get to is the receptivity to solutions that are not always high tech. Sometimes they're quite simple, but they need to be done every time for every clinical setting that's appropriate. It's interesting to think about that from the perspective of in the operating room about how that might <laughs> particularly work, but uh, Lee. So I, I see a lot of effort uh, trying to building up um, the knowledge base for genomics, both from industry and also academia. So I'm wondering um, whether this knowledge base development is part of the scope of this uh, discussion or the CDS you know, discussion we have here is more interesting the interface between CDS and the knowledge base. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And, and the way I would characterize it is that um, uh, we're probably not primarily focused on developing the knowledge base. I think there are other initiatives um, that are being um, funded through Genome and others that are working on the knowledge base, but it's much more about uh, uh, accessing uh, the knowledge base and then um, doing whatever is needed to interpret that uh, in knowledge representation to drive the CDS. So that's how I would uh, define that. So I think Alex is next and then. Well, my question is, was exactly <laughs> along those lines. Uh, one big difference uh, in the three cases you listed, you know, nuclear power plants, aviation, <clears throat> and healthcare is uh, the amount of knowledge and the kinds of knowledge. So aviation and nuclear power plants are both physical uh, systems and uh, operation of these systems does not involve uh, uh, rapid evolution of knowledge in physics or aerodynamics. So, uh, the issue, you know, uh, there is one item which is the, uh, on the list of 14, which is linking of the discovery science. Uh, 
Uh, I would say, uh, you know, coming from the research side, I see uh, that expanding in five or six subtopics, and importantly, actually, discovery science creates an incentive for sharing knowledge and uh, improvement of care, you know, monitoring of uh, phase four clinical trials and, and so on, which is actually a key to adoption of knowledge sharing as, uh, as uh, creating an incentive for knowledge sharing. So that was my comment about the research side, that it creates that incentive and that this uh, uh, healthcare is different from these two other systems in that regard. So, so actually at the conference in San Diego, it was our presumption as well that look, these are physical systems, they're well known. And we discovered that it's actually not the case that, that uh, nuclear power plants have thousands of sensors, hundreds of control mechanisms. And then when things go off nominal uh, and change very quickly, they often get a massive information overload and they don't know what the problem is. And so it's not as certain as you might imagine. And in aviation also being overtaken by um, rare variant kinds of uh, co-occurrences of events and systems failures and too much information in one area, not enough in another. So um, we thought as well that healthcare is sitting in an entirely different space and it turns out they suffer from the same issues of complexity, information overload, and having to make decisions that are um, decisive at a time when you're not certain that you, that you even know what the problem is. So it's a little closer than we thought. So if I can just take moderator's prerogative and follow up a, a bit on that. You used a term in your talk um, in a different way uh, than I did, uh, uh, than I do in terms of closed loop. And I think you were talking about closing the loop relating to making sure that we understand the outcomes related to uh, action on, on decisions. Uh, but there's a form of decision support, you know, closed loop decision support where it acts autonomously without, you know, the intervention of, uh, of clinicians. And obviously that requires high evidence base and high reliability. So I, my question to you is, again, in a comparison to the nuclear regulatory uh, uh, or the, uh, the nuclear industry and the aviation industry, how much reliance is there on closed versus open loop um, decision support? Well, so we have a pretty mature instance of that in healthcare and, you know, the FDA device uh, guidelines for anything that removes a healthcare provider from a key decision loop and the, the poster child is the insulin pump that autonomously regulates you know, blood glucose. <clears throat> uh, and so I, in that setting, there's the engineering specifications and the proof that systems cannot fail and, and that there are safeguards that if they fail, they fail safe and all, is actually a pretty mature uh, uh, engineering kind of environment. Uh, but I think in genomics, we're not going to be in closed loop in that sense of having a device that makes a decision on the basis of, of a SNP or a haplotype for the foreseeable future. And so our, our problem is complicated by this filtering of the information through uh, professional um, decision makers or patients or yeah. both. Um, to put this conference in one context, What's your best educated guess of the timeline to rampant personalized medicine and the whole genome sequencing? And relatedly, is it going to be the IT aspects that are likely to be the bottlenecks, which will be mandatory, or uh, will be the genomics knowledge and sequencing? That's a very interesting question. Um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, as uh, Prediction is difficult, particularly when it involves the future, right? Uh, uh, who, who thinks that the Yogi Berra said that? <laughs> it wasn't. It was Niels Bohr, uh, which I think is fascinating. But um, I think the, the interesting question there is that um, uh, I think it will happen sooner than we predict it is pretty obvious. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm around this. Uh, I think that knowledge should be the bottleneck, but likely won't be. Uh, I think that, um, you know, the, in some ways, the fact that we're having a meeting about decision support, which is an IT solution to this, even when, you know, our knowledge is relatively uh, uh, infantile, um, is an indicator that, you know, we're looking for uh, solutions to a problem that we don't particularly understand. So I always get very concerned about the idea that, you know, 
uh, we're pushing things out that perhaps are not ready for, for, for prime time. But that is our inherent nature. Uh, and so I think in as much as we can look at this from the perspective of saying uh, we clearly will need these types of solutions to be able to effectively use this because if we don't have them then it really would become the Wild West. So this may be a non-inferiority type of a, of a scenario. Uh, but perhaps uh, also the idea that we could utilize some of these things to say um, you know, to filter out information, and, and maybe this gets at the paternalism that, that uh, you know, the paternalism versus, you know, open access, that in the context of healthcare delivery, we always make decisions about data that we should or shouldn't use, and, you know, uh, uh, how do we, you know, uh, build our systems to, you know, use best, best information. The challenge that we've had, of course, is that that always is, is right now these decisions are invariably local. Uh, decisions, and I think all of us envision a time where we have to have something that's really more uh, um, spread than it is, you know, relying on each of our systems to somehow be able to solve this. Yeah, Mark, um, quick one, um, and this may sound odd coming from a person who works for an EHR vendor, be it Cerner, but I really don't think we can get there without some kind of common shared infrastructure to pull this off, because right now every EMR out there, mine included, has its own native internal CDS tooling, and that's standard. But from where this group wants to go and where we need to get to in terms of something that can grow, that can scale, that can benefit the community, can benefit research, it has to work with all of our disparate EMR type systems, but I think something common's got to stand up in the middle for this to enable this to flow. I just don't see any other way around that. Call me crazy, but I just don't. The alternative is death by PDF. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and uh, it's good to follow on, JD, because um, I think it's helpful to contrast, I think, carrying on on Ken's theme, I think another barrier is that um, we don't have a good framework for managing lack of consensus. So with the alert fatigue issue, there's good consensus around the science and so therefore to an experienced clinician those alerts feel obvious. In genomics there's not consensus and so I think there's a greater need for um, some sort of decision support but at the same time the organizations in this room probably don't agree about how to handle warfarin dosing and, and genotype and you know that's an area where there's reasonably well developed science but there's not consensus and so and then from the EMR vendor, from the FDA oversight perspective, from the liability perspective, they'll be reluctant to provide that knowledge, especially with a lack of consensus. So I think it's going to be useful to really think about what is a framework for managing areas where there is lack of consensus. Maybe it's a matter of a clearinghouse where we are very descriptive about where there is a lack of consensus and then each organization can choose among disagreeing protocols, but at least they're choosing something and then standing behind that with their own internal legal structures. It um, this may not be generalizable because I work in a fairly peculiar uh, clinical setting of um, many patients or nearly all of whom are phenotypic outliers, uh, but one phenomenon I've noticed is that the, for trainees, the more structure and guidance we provide to them, it seems to me, at least anecdotally, the less they think. And I wondered, it, how did the nuclear industry and the airline industry, did they observe that phenomenon, i.e., did it reduce the ability of the operators to recognize situations that are outside of the CDS or decision support that they were using? And if they observed that, what did they do to train people to overcome that problem? Yeah, so they both tra tra they trained for um, team-based decision making both of them, and they have explicit guidelines that <clears throat> took down the old captain of the, the ship model. Actually, when I got my pilot's license in 1970, I was early on exposed to this standard joke in aviation that rule one is the captain's always right, and rule two is when in doubt, rule one, see rule one. <laughs> and it was only said in partially in jest. And so these extreme hierarchies that were based on the learned, uh, experienced professional being the top of the pyramid 
were in fact identified as, as the source of potentially uh, colossal uh, unreli unreliability. And so training to this uh, joint decision-making model of uh, mul multiple persons participating in, in key decisions um, is evident there, but uh, it still is the case that in both nuclear power and in aviation, there is assignment of responsibility. So the, the pilot in command, the PIC, is finally responsible for, among all the decisions made in collaboration with others, one person takes the responsibility for saying, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And so there are hybrid models, and uh, it, in an intellectually challenging and cog cognitively intense domain, and both of those are, um, the ed expectation for training and the amount of training it takes has actually gone up substantially. So you'd imagine that if they get, if they get dumb and happy because they've got too much decision support, there'd, there'd actually be less training because you'd be relying on systems to do it for. But in fact, they have raised the bar for the level of the individuals understanding the behavior of the systems that they control. And so with glass cockpit avionics, complexity has dramatically escalated over the old round gauges, and it's gotten a lot harder. A whole generation of pilots has just left because they can't do it. And so it, the observation there is that you haven't seen this devaluing of, of the human cognitive element, but rather it's also been clicked up a notch in terms of the level of sophistication of the reasoning required by the practitioners, even in these highly automated environments. So uh, you've been through two different um, training environments yourself, medical and aviation. I assume you're not trained to run a nuclear power plant too? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, what's your uh, thinking about um, uh, the prospects of the cultural change in medical training, the challenge of that cultural change, which I view as a really huge issue compared to the cultural change that had to happen in aviation training? Um, you know, so I'll just, I'll just insert here that, I mean, the, the, we could obviously spend an entire five days on that because that is the bigger issue. So, so I don't want us to necessarily get sidetracked in something that's a key issue, but probably not um, uh, uh, directly relevant to what we're about. But, but please do uh, respond briefly to that because I think it is important. Um, I think the power is in the data and the power is in, in systems that provide uh, real value at the point of care. So in places like Vanderbilt that have um, you know, highly automated uh, workstation-based care done by teams, um, the students learn from the data as well as from their elders about the socializing in the profession. So the transition from the apogee of the profession being the learned autonomous professional to this systems uh, model is achievable and it mostly exists on the it, it depends upon the existence of effective systems actually running in the environment. That becomes a very powerful educational tool. It, uh, but otherwise, it if it's just a faculty opinion, you're right, things will not change. Okay, yeah, and I would just, uh, <laughs> I would just point out that, um, you know, in, in uh, organizations that have made the transition, what we hear from the providers is that uh, because a lot of the things that are, you know, they would normally take up a lot of time on, which are routine that can be managed by, you know, systems-based care, that what they actually find it to be a much better environment because they're applying all of their cognitive assets to tough nuts to crack as opposed to, you know, using it on a routine basis. So I think we're beginning to see that emerge uh, in, in healthcare systems that have, but, but the cultural transition to that point is really challenging and clearly we are still training our practitioners in an, in an apprentice-based model, a distributed apprentice-based model, but nonetheless it's a master apprentice and that is not going to necessarily uh, move this uh, forward very, very quickly. Sure, Jamie from uh, ONC and this is just such a, you know, exciting conversation. We were just talking about this back at ONC just uh, this week about this whole loop of CDS and especially the concept of um, the public library. Um, I have a question though because, you know, especially on, based on what JD was saying with Cerner, you know, each of, the C each, each of the EHRs have their native CDS and we'd love to get to this ideal state where 
EHRs are chosen based on the usability of their platform rather than the um, the accuracy of their CDS or the you know the you know CDS values. And so, um, but Blackford, you said something about you know us moving from evidence-based medicine to practice-based evidence. And if we're moving in that direction, how does that affect the knowledge processing? And how does that affect, you know, creating this public library of CDS? Thank you. A great question, and, and thanks for coming. Um, you know, I, I think this, there's going to be a spectrum of evidence from, you know, that which is expert-derived and consensus-oriented to that which is purely numerically derived, if you will, from analysis. And it's a spectrum because, of course, each, you know, the knowledge will go in each direction, from data-based evidence to consensus and from guidelines to be informed by up updated uh, data. If we have a true learning health system, you know, ideally we would have an open knowledge repository of kind of the classic guideline-based decision support artifacts, but also be able to not only rate them and assess their performance with a variety of measures of CDS uh, performance, but to combine that with, you know, derived parameters, if you will, from database analyses going on around the country. The Shrine experiments at Stanford, for example, were very interesting, reported in the New England Journal, and, you know, uh, I don't know enough about that assessment to say whether or not there were generalizable knowledge artifacts that would come out of that that could be put into the Open Knowledge Repository, but that would be the idea. And it goes back to the virtuous learning cycle. You have to not only support the decision support, but then measure its impact contextually so you can feed back. And it could be both population-based rating from users, if you will, of knowledge artifacts, as well as their performance and practice. Do you mind if I ask one more quick thing? Um, is um, There's this step that I'm not hearing conversation of, and I don't know if it's the, um, you know, if it's the conversation to have here or not, but I'm going to throw it out is the step between knowledge processing and then the, you know, public library, library of CDS. We need to have some sort of service that creates that knowledge into computable logic. And I'm just going to throw that out there and we can meet. Yeah, I think we'll have a whole session on that. Uh, um, in, in, I would find that uh, within the knowledge representation um, Sphere. So I think that we'll have a lot of uh, uh, opportunities in that area to really drill down uh, on that. Jim, I think can I had. Can I put up a teaser, oh, yeah. though? Just, just a teaser, because you're right on target. And Ken and, and I and a number of other folks have done experiments in exactly that thing of creating, taking the knowledge artifact, whichever resource or however it's created, and then putting it into a cloud based service. So the Sebastian experiments, the CDS consortium experiments did, did exactly that. And that's the trick. To getting to JD's point, you know, how do we actually make this actionable, this knowledge or this resource usable in disparity of Mars? And then there's a host of issues around that. Brandon, I think I had you next. Okay. Um, so I wanted to comment on just two things. One was um, the alert fatigue issue, because I mean, that's the main thing operationally you hear about, which is why are you bombarding me with all this useless stuff? or other words for stuff. And I think um, <laughs> this, this relates to the, the intertwined nature of genomic CDS with other CDS, where we can have the most perfect genomic CDS that's 100% accurate. If it's in the sea of things that people always just click the X, cancel out, it's just going to be completely ignored. So it just, we need to create this feedback loop, the closed loop system for everything so we can turn off things completely unrelated genomic CDS so the genomic CDS can pop up towards the top and actually people will look at it rather than just cancel it out and ask, wait, that looked slightly different from the usual thing I click out, what happened there? And I think the other comment with um, the notion of uh, ideal state is I think it would be really useful to come up with the clinical use case scenarios and just the storyboards of what we're talking about. What is the experience of the clinician? What is the experience of the IT person where it's like, oh, I just go to this public thing and just download it and I just need to customize these things and now it starts working. I, th I think having those targets and defining those targets so it's not so amorphous would be really helpful to get everyone on the same page and to say, get some agreement on this is exactly what we're talking about of what we want to see happen and then we can just concentrate on, oh, let's just figure out a way to get that done. I think getting that agreement is really important. Yeah, I 
I think that's a really important uh, point, and we uh, actually went back and forth for uh, and actually had some use cases that we were going to uh, potentially use to tee up, and we ultimately decided uh, uh, to um, uh, focus more on, on, on the desiderata, uh, but, uh, uh, and, and I apologize to those of you, um, uh, we've had this discussion in other contexts about, uh, about the use of use case, which is sort of a term of art, which in the, within informatics and everybody else kind of scratches their head and said, what are you guys talking about? Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. So, um, uh, so what, this is really, though, um, you know, sort of the bread and butter for uh, for in informatics design is to say what what is the problem that we're really trying to solve. Let's define the case, and so it really is extremely useful, and then building out from that. So I think that's a uh, that's a really good um, uh, point to make. So I had. I, I want to make a comment on the. Um the implementation side of the CDS. In our institute, uh, we have uh, like pharmacogenetics expert board or cancer tumor board to really implement those uh, clinical decisions. And I think at least in the foreseeable future, I think that's probably the model in our institute we're going to implement. So whatever I think the CDS we're talking about here, I think to some extent the local fruit is that how this system can really help them to improve the implementation, you know, I think this is kind of a short-term thing, but i just wondering, you know, from this model uh, to the next level model, say, you know, pushing a more general setting, I think this takes some sort of process. How do we do this? So I just one of the comments I have. Yeah, that, that's something that's coming up, and I'm definitely flagging that related to the idea that right now, you know, we're, everybody that is doing this is doing it locally using their own methodologies. How do we make it more um, generalizable? So at Heidi next then Adam, then Brandon. In thinking about the airline versus healthcare um, environment, I'm thinking about the incentives in the airline industry, which I see as efficiency, customer service, and safety being top priority, whereas in the healthcare industry, um, although those are factors, much more high priority is reimbursement, which centers around fee for service and lots of visits and lots of protocol, you know, uh, procedures and things like that, really going far against efficiency, safety, and, and uh, you know, um, customer satisfaction. So I'm curious as to whether we see the need to move to accountable care environments as necessary before we really can make any movement in clinical decision support because the healthcare industry is not willing to put up the dollars into clinical decision support until they actually see true healthcare savings in a different model for reimbursement, or if we think the fledgling efforts in accountable care reimbursement models that are starting to evolve are actually going to start to push that clinical decision support need and, and sort of which comes first. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, a really good point. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting as you talked about, you know, the healthcare system versus, you know, none of us, I think, when we're booking our tickets on our various carriers, look and say, well, gosh, which one is most likely to get me to my, uh, uh, to the right destination <laughs> without crashing the, the airplane and, 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 yeah, and, and who's the pilot and all this sort of stuff. We don't ask those questions because they've gotten to the point of you know, where that's just inherent. You don't think about that. You know, the fact that the, we're even talking about issues of, you know, we have to improve patient safety, I think, is, is in some ways an indictment on how we've approached, you know, medical care in the first place. But I think to some degree, the point that you're making, uh, we have sort of implicitly decided that business as usual will not sustain in this country. And so we are in some ways assuming an ideal state of a healthcare system that is in fact focused on value, reliability, and safety. And, and while I think that that may be illusory to some degree, uh, for the purposes of this discussion, let's just pretend that that is in fact what the uh, motivation is. Um, uh, but when we actually go back, we are going to have to deal with these, you know, with these types of, uh, with these types of issues. So uh, I had um, Adam next, and I got you. So I'm just going to go back a few comments uh, and pick up on the knowledge base uh, first. And Dan, thanks for your presentation. I thought it was great. Uh, I, I wanted to pick up on one of the items you, you noted, which was trying to maintain an updated knowledge base and have it constantly updating. Uh, and I want to 
frame it in the context of how the current system works, and I'll maybe pick on JD for a second, because notwithstanding your current comment, from what I understand from the system, we're not, that is much more of a pull type of draw, and right now it's more of a push. And so I think what happens is that knowledge base is being given to the HR vendors, the HR vendor has to then go and update the system, however often they do that, to be able to have that new knowledge coming in. Um, I, I think in order to get to the ideal, now, ideal base we want for genomics, we need to think in terms of how the current ecosystem works for, for data transfer and flow between different providers and vendors, because there's an entire you know, party of third parties that are involved here that we haven't really been discussing. And I've had the conversation with groups like First Data Bank, who would like to have that sort of cloud support, the, you know, the push model. But that isn't generally the case here. So I, I, I think we do need to consider the ecosystem that we're working in, figure out what kind of cultural changes or, or business structures we, that would need to change to accept that type of a system. You know, it's a great point. And with the ONC um, person in the room, you know, one of the things that's being considered in MU3 is this idea of the open APIs or at least some standardization of an API construct that then service providers could use, you know, for a variety of different things. And the idea of the ecosystem is right on target, too, because there may be, you know, predict services offered from Vanderbilt, there may be BillyRubinTool.org offered from Stanford, there may be other things mm -hmm. offered from the Mayo, and that ecosystem of services should be a competitive marketplace. And it's starting with companies like IMO, which, for example, intelligent medical objects, provide all their stuff via a service from the cloud. So. We're getting there, but a little regulatory pressure might help. Yeah, and plus with the emergence of the smart on fire type application stack slash standard, that's getting us to the point to where we can truly have an ecosystem like this. And especially, Adam, back to your point, you look at the ultimate deliverable out of a CDS action, it's an order. <laughs> and that flows through a very traditional pipe through an EMR. What happens before that, if you look at what happens today, take computers out of it, it's you would go get your buddy in the hallway and you would have a discussion. <laughs> you guys would converse and say, is it this, is that, okay, great, and then I'm gonna go do this. It's enabling that type of a conversation where it's not an order. An order's gonna come out of the other side of the system, but it's a conversation where you have to interact with services and ecosystem to move the data around in a meaningful way that can be tracked, because at the end of the day, as we talked about risk earlier today, that whole thing is a medical decision process that at some point the FDA is going to put their arms around, as they should, that has to be tracked and time-stamped and version control, that kind of stuff. But it's, it is an ecosystem that we've got to enable to build. Yeah, I think, uh, Adam, also, um, you know, the discussion is taking place, again, in the context where we know that uh, Genome and, and others are, are trying to fund some of these um, efforts like, uh, you know, ClinGen and uh, and ClinVar, and that there are, in fact, aspects of those projects that are looking specifically at integrating with, uh, with EHRs. And so, you know, I think there, we are cognizant of the fact that there isn't the ecosystem, and we need to be cognizant of that as well. It doesn't necessarily need to be the sole focus of what we're talking about, uh, but I think as we begin to develop ideas, we have to, you know, to some degree, you know, give them the test of, you know, how realistic is this, and I think this gets to what Blackford was pointing out, that ideal may be here, but if the distance is, is enormous, then maybe that's not the one to start with. Maybe we pick, take one that's a little bit closer to ideal where we might be able to achieve it, and assuming that, you know, there's not some sort of a uh, if this, then that uh, type of thing. Uh, Brandon, I had you next. Yeah, so uh, just one comment uh, with regards to, I guess, uh, scope of this meeting. Uh, the way I look at it is we have genomic decision support, but we, we don't have genomic decision support and we have a separate decision support. It's really decision support and genomics is one aspect of that decision support. And I think a lot of things have kind of come up, like the interface, the interoperability with the EHRs, so, so the workflow integration. That's that larger decision support issue that we're not the only ones working on. There's many other people, Anka's already thinking about this, there's a lot of groups already out there working on that. I think our time would be more efficient if we looked at the specific aspects related to genome decision support and assume that 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 larger decision support issues that, that people are already working on and let's focus more time on the genomic aspects of it so we can be more efficient. Yeah, I think that, you know, this is an important point and, and uh, it, we're about an hour and a half in, so, uh, but one of the, the sub-bullets under this key question was, is genomic 
clinical decision support exceptional compared to other clinical decision support. And as I've been listening to the conversation, I've heard aspects of both of that being presented. And so I would not necessarily accept as axiomatic that, you know, genomic CDS is a subset of CDS and that solutions that will come from, uh, from the general will be necessarily applicable. I think it's something that we'll need to actually accurately um, uh, assess to, at least within our group, say, you know, is it exceptional? If so, how exceptional? What are the exceptional aspects that we need to address? And it may end up coming down to, you know, the points that you're bringing up, which is let's just focus on, you know, perhaps the knowledge aspects and less about the structure of CDS. But I wouldn't necessarily presume that at the outset. Jim, I realized I skipped you um, because I, 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 uh, I leaned over to this Jim instead. So my, my, my fault. And then I'll get to, to you, Josh. Sorry. Thanks. I just wanted to make the point, I think all the discussion around alert fatigue is really important, and I think we have the opportunity to think about that uh, prospectively and some of the work we've done with CPIC and designing workflows, we've kept alert fatigue in mind, and actually I think genomics gives some opportunities to be very specific. Um, it represents other challenges. But I also wanted to mention that um, I think we have to keep in mind that CES is much more than that interruptive point of care alert. I think that's where our minds often go right away for CDS, but it's much bigger than that. Uh, and so we just need to keep that in mind as we discuss. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I want to go back to Heidi's comment about what's going to motivate uh, some of this uh, genomic CDS. And I, I, I think one uh, reflection on our own program is that, you know, patients are extremely enthusiastic about this area. And so even though you may uh, need um, as a prerequisite a system that can create CDS or, or deliver CDS. Um, a lot of this may be motivated by patients. And so one of the interesting aspects that I think we'll get to a little bit later is what aspect of the knowledge are we going to expose to patients and are, you know, how does that affect the physician uh, patient communication piece? So I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Thanks. Betsy. I was. Uh struck as I always am by Dan's comments, but the issue of one, um, if it happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. And I have been thinking, well, where is an area where you could promote that most quickly with greatest success in a hospital competitive type of environment? And um, I think it might be in an area that's been getting a little announcements lately about we should have a national database, we should, NCPI should be involved in building and whatever, and it is this issue of the anti, of the, you know, uh, antibiotic resistance and also the already successful stuff that's going ahead in terms of foodborne illnesses and tracking them down. Because it seems to me that it's very hard for a hospital not to think that if it happens to one of us, next week somebody with that antibiotic resistance strain could show up in my area and then how would I control it? And it also is an area where, um, you know, finding out whether you've got one of those and what's happening to them. So it seemed to me that that might be a place where you could, while we're worrying about payment and all the rest of it, which is a big mess, as Heidi has said, we might get people to think about, well, yes, if it happens to one of us, it happens to all of us, and maybe make some progress there while we were trying to solve the whole uh, structure of U.S. health care. Yeah, we'll take that on in our next meeting. <laughs> Just a comment to follow up from the, the question around, is genomic medicine, CDS, um, significantly different from CDS in general, and how should we approach the specific goals of this meeting, we actually have 14 points here that we've used to quantify what we think is important for genomic CDS. Although I actually think what was done is quantifying a mixture of genomic CDS and general CDS. If we were to go through the process of ranking these for CDS and for genomic CDS, where they end up different rankings, maybe the areas that we should target if we want to go after genomic CDS and not CDS in general, because as I look at this, some of these rankings, and I come purely from the genomic side, are not so important for, they're not the highest priority for genomic CDS, even though they may be very important for CDS in general. Great. 
thanks. I'm sure that all of you would love to have a, yet another survey to fill out, but we may, uh, we may decide to do that anyway. So, uh, um, uh, Dan. The, the business of <clears throat> whether genomic CDS is exceptional or not, it, it, there, there is one aspect, I think, where, where it sort of treads into territory that other CDS doesn't, and that's the business of the family. Um, for, for some of the pharmacogenetic variants it's not that, that we've been implementing, it's, it's, that's not a big issue. But when we start to get into risk prediction for serious, even monogen so-called monogenic diseases, uh, cancer susceptibility, some of the cardiomyopathies, for example, the CDS has to extend to the idea that, well, we detected this variant in this patient. Uh, that patient doesn't have much of a phenotype, but it is also entirely within the realm of possibility that that members of that family who share that gene, who share that particular variant, will have a phenotype, and that muddies the waters considerably. But it it it, it is one aspect in which, you know, what you deliver to the clinician taking care of that particular patient uh, may include advice on what to do about kids, may include advice to uh, advice to what to do about kids to adult doctors or advice to pediatricians about what to do about the 80-year-olds. So it's, it's worth thinking about. Les, and then Ken will give you the last word. Uh, another cultural question. My impression is, is that uh, aviation has done a phenomenal job in sort of taking the adversarial punitive components out of problem assessment. Um, and my impression is that in medicine, we are the exact opposite of that, that we have a highly arbitrary, highly adversarial, punitive uh, way of dealing with errors, which leads to that rubbish uh, that was mentioned earlier about including every possible conceivable risk that might be in the package insert, uh, which is mostly clinically useless just to CYA. Um, what do you think are the prospects of changing that in, in healthcare, and is it necessary to change that to adopt these models like aviation? So, so there is a thing called the Aviation Safety Reporting System, ASRS, and if when you mess up, when you break one of the rules, as long as you don't bend any metal or commit a crime doing it, you actually get a get out of jail card, get out of jail free card from the FAA for reporting that you caused an error or you had a difficulty that caused you to deviate from a reliable uh, practice. And it is a, a fault free separation of understanding the cause of the problem from the assignment of blame. And, and we have those two so tightly integrated in, in healthcare that I. I, I, one could imagine an aviation safety reporting like system for medical, um, you know, uh, things that clinicians know that cause them to make uh, mistakes or not uh, produce best practice, but I haven't seen a, uh, an initiative to do that. The other thing that's that relative to the, it, the motivations to improve rapidly as an industry, apropos of what Heidi said, is uh, David Gaba, who is an uh, anesthesiologist at Stanford, was at this uh, nuclear power conference, observed that there's a big difference between these industries in that when they deviate from li reliable standards, they, they lose the means of production. They, the airplane gets taken out of service, the power plant's taken offline, they lose their means of producing income. And he said, you know, if in, in healthcare, as an anesthesiologist, he said, you know, when, when we have an adverse uh, outcome we, or you know, maybe result, maybe the, uh, a patient dies, uh, we just call for the next patient. And, and that, it, that if an OR was taken out of service when there was deviation from reliable practice, there'd be much stronger organizational incentive to get better quickly. Yeah, I think that um, anybody that's ever attended a surgical morbidity and mortality conference would uh, agree with that, you know, we're, we're really good at assigning blame. There are some examples where um, when there's been, uh, you know, a, a, a strategic uh, failure or a, a sentinel event that more of a root cause analysis type of approach without uh, blame is to be, 
understanding that the vast majority of these are not individual, but it's they're systematic errors. And so some systems are doing this. The interesting thing, um, and I think Intermountain probably has the most data on this, uh, is that uh, they find from a liability perspective, an individual practitioner liability, that the CDS and the uh, work that goes relating to vetting the, the knowledge and guidelines behind the CDS actually provides better defense because the documentation of why decisions are made is much more robust in those situations where CDS has been um, uh, activated because they have, in fact, closed the loop and capture all of the relevant information about why that decision was made. And so they've actually found that in those cases they they're easier to defend an individual physician that might be flagged uh, from a liability perspective. So uh, Ken and then we'll move to our break. And knowing I'm standing before break, I'll be quick. So I, I'm really interested by this notion of genetic exceptionalism. And my just practical thought is if we focus on genomics being different, it'll be harder. It'll be harder to get other people to help us. It'll be harder to say, oh, you're working on something so similar. Let's work on it. So my thought is it might make sense to say, what are people doing in general distance support to try to scale for ONC, CMS, coming up with standards, the health services platform work with Smart on Fire, et cetera, and say, instead, what are, how could we use this platform and what would we need to add to it to support our use case? Because bottom line, resources are finite and it makes a lot of sense to combine resources, I think. I'm so glad you're co-moderating the implementation session that's going to be, because be, uh, that seems to me to fall squarely within that. So uh, uh, I think that that may be something to tee up as we uh, uh, move into that space this afternoon. So uh, with that, again, uh, another thank you to Dan for an outstanding uh, talk. And uh, much as I was anticipating, I, I didn't uh, figure we would have a crowd of shrinking violets that we would be having a difficult time extracting information from. So uh, Blackford and I, are, and as well as our recorders, are, are um, trying to capture this. And, and uh, our job uh, will be to synthesize all these uh, good ideas into something that makes sense. So uh, we are now on break uh, until 10.30, uh, in which, and then we'll reconvene and start talking about uh, data issues.